Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. All right, we're here this week with Professor Steve Sademan from Carleton University, and uh, there's been some commentary from the federal government over the last week about them basically reaching the capacity, uh, or the limits of their capacity to help provinces, particularly through things like the Canadian Forces. And you're the you're the military guy I like to turn to, so I figured we could talk a little bit about what some of these limitations are and why this kind of matters. Um, and I guess I, the first thing I would kind of preface this as is we tend to have this notion, I think, that's largely coming from the Americans that if you've got a big problem, send in the military and they'll <laughs> kind of fix it. And, and I don't know that it works quite the same way in Canada. Well, the thing about the United States is they actually have a federal force they can send into places without involving the U.S. military. They have FEMA, the right. Federal Emergency Management Agency. And they also have the National Guard. And while we consider the National Guard an, um, a military thing, it's a very, very different beast than the Canadian Reserves. And so there's much bigger labor pool in the United States to throw at things, just even you know per capita, because of the existence of, of those two institutions. Canada has, when it, wants, when it has an emergency, it does not have a large pool of folks who've been standing around not doing anything. And that's... An unfair way to describe the military, but they are the spare labor force that they have. Their day job allows them to be flexible because they're always either training for the next mission or 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 doing the next mission. But most of the time, they're they're in their barracks preparing for the next thing. So they are a, a, a ready labor force, and they also have logistical training expertise chain of command, all that kind of stuff that's really handy to throw at major emergencies. So that's on the one side, there's a supply thing. Now to think about it, there's a demand thing, right? Which is hmm. every province um, has to ask for help, right? They did, it's just not the federal government making decisions about where to send troops. It's right. ask for help. And climate change uh, in particular has increased the demand with floods and fires in particular, but also now the pandemic yeah and and so that's really important and the thing is there's a, another development here which is while technically the provinces can be asked to pay for the deployment of canadian armed forces canadian politicians have, have have declined to do so they think it's inappropriate to ask provinces to pay for the emergency help they get and so that creates a tendency for provinces to go wait i can get help and not pay for it you know i have to pay for it well, these, these guys are taking play, the places of nurses and other staff that ordinarily problems have to pay for. Wouldn't it be great for these, these soldiers to stick around a while longer? And is it because they're needed to be, or is it because it's convenient? It's hard to say. And that's, that's a really good question that, you know, people should perhaps be asking uh, provincial leaders. Um, and I guess with this in mind, um, this notion that we've got constrained capacity has kind of been on my, my radar for a little while. I do recall hearing from, I think it was the, the, the chief of defense staff several months ago, possibly last year, to the effect that we can't keep sending soldiers out to take care of all these domestic problems because they're not able to do their own jobs in terms of not only the training, but in terms of, yeah, the, the other things they're supposed to be doing for the day-to-day -day stuff. And that seems to me like it's going to be a, a big tension going forward as we're, we're, we're looking for the, the military to do more and more of this kind of disaster relief. Well, that, that was General Air before he was a chief. He said it when he was acting, when he was, when he was the Army chief. Okay. Because the Army ends up getting asked to do this a lot more than the Navy or the Air Force because they have the bodies to throw at these things. And he said this the January before the pandemic. Right. So literally, as the pandemic was rising in Asia and before it hit our shores, he was saying this is hard because of the increased pace due to flood, the fires and floods that were climatic change induced. And and so, yes, there's an increased flow of, of, of uh, requests. Uh, and so there's two things that are happening now. One is the government's being hit hard with these. It's usually it's one province at a time, maybe two provinces at a time, but now they're getting like three, four or five provinces plus a bunch of reserves asking for help. And so usually 
you know, again, the responsibility is for province to ask for help and then the government then provides the help. But now the pro government is going to be in the role of actually having to triage requests and ration and say, okay, you might need this, but these folks need this more. So that's going to send, you know, uh, you know, pit province against province or province against uh, the national government, the federal government. So that, that's one part of this dynamic. The second is, well, there's there is a way out of this 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 dilemma if one of two things: either actually have a real FEMA, or two, the K military changes priorities, so it no longer sees domestic emergency operations as an inconvenience that gets in the way of foreign operations, and actually makes this their day job. Um, and if we I suppose that they do the latter, what does that end up doing for our ability to contribute internationally? Well, it might change what we do. We might not agree to do quite as much training of uh, foreign folks. Right now, we're training the Iraqi military, we're training the Ukrainian military, and we're also part of a NATO deterrence and reassurance mission in Latvia. And I, I would obviously say at this moment in time, there's no way we should ever leave that mission because the Russians need to be uh, told not to, you know, to, to stay in the, the other side of the border. But mm. that's not clear why we should be in Iraq anymore. Right. I mean, the reason why we're in Iraq right now is that troops are sent a while to go to Iraq to, to train the Iraqis to defeat ISIS. But there's plenty of other countries that can do that. Um, maybe they're there right now to prevent the conservatives from accusing the liberals of giving up on the war on terror. Uh, and so that's one possibility. Um, maybe it is that we need to realign the Canadian Armed Forces so that way we still have the ability to do these foreign things. But we change the priorities, we change the incentives for officers and, and enlisted folks that they get more breaks, you know, and more recognition for the domestic stuff. Right now, if you're in a foreign, op if you're in a foreign deployment, you get, you know, time off when you come back. When you do domestic operation, you do domestic operation, then you go back to whatever it was you were doing before. Um, and, you know, everybody who's been in, in the top of the Kingdom Armed Forces the last 10, 15 years has served, has commanded in Afghanistan. Well, A, there's no opportunity to come into Afghanistan anymore. And B, maybe we need to think a little bit about what we need to be modeling the key military after. And so this, this feeds to a larger culture change thing, which is maybe if we didn't have the military sort of model itself after the average special operations officer and instead had a wider variety of roles that we valued, then maybe we wouldn't have the military try to imitate the most homogenous, exclusive male dominated part of the military and that might actually have consequences for the rest of the military but this is a huge ask to change the culture of the military to make them care more about the domestic operations for them to to have that be part of their promotion process as opposed to just as far and stuff okay um the other thing that strikes me is that um the the military is in a bit of a recruitment crisis and they're down tens of thousands of people from where they should be. Um, I remember at least, least 7,500. Sorry? Uh, then the official number is 7,500 out of 6,000. Okay. So that's, that's, um, that's more than 10%, which is and, big uh, And I, I remember I was at a, <clears throat> a function uh, in the before times and uh, some Navy guys were talking about the, the new uh, slush breakers uh, that are coming online and how basically they don't have people to crew them. Uh, the government went ahead and built these eight boats and they've got nobody who can act, you know, to, to crew them full time. Um, and so this kind of strikes to me as one of the other problems that is going to need to be addressed in terms of um, ensuring that we've got bodies and capacity going forward. This is a huge problem. And you know, if you're advertising for a year that you have a huge crisis of sexual misconduct and abuse of power, it probably doesn't help your recruitment, even if there wasn't a pandemic that was also getting away from recruitment. So this, and what makes things worse in the military, but good for society, the job market is pretty good, right? Yeah. Right. So between those various factors, it's hard. It's hard to recruit anyway. And then it's harder to recruit when the economic times are good. And it's harder to recruit still when you have your own personnel crisis. So they've got to fix their personnel crisis and be able to advertise that it's that it's better. Uh, they just have to lump it when the economy is good and, and just figure out other ways to recruit. And so there's culture change aspects to that that would make it easier to recruit, which is um, there was one, I saw a speaker once talking about, you know, he was lamenting the, the, the declining 
number of uh, babies being born around the world because that was going to mean less military folks. And I was like, well, you know, the, the reason for that is women are being educated and are <laughs> double the size of the recruitment pool by actually making it welcoming to women. Then suddenly you actually have a lot more people who are available. And the same goes for immigrants. If we can, you know, drum out the white supremacists in the military, then you're more likely to have uh, people who are who are targets of white supremacists will be willing to join the military. Yeah, uh, and so they can do things to reform recruiting, so that way they're not just going for the usual suspects. Uh, so that they have a wider labor pool, so that way they end up getting more or at least better recruits. So that's a possibility, but this is all part of a larger thing uh, where. You know, they've, there are basic things that are that, that have been problems for the CAF for a while now. And if we can get at that, that's going to help out these other problems that are all more intensified mm-hmm. because of the crisis that the CAF is going through. Uh, and, and thinking about this kind of trying to change the culture to be more inclusive, this is one of the things I've noticed in the last few years is, um, is that the military has made a really concerted effort around things like pride events around the country to recruit um, LGBT members, which um, would be unfathomable a decade ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they're, they're seriously, they're, they're serious about this. They just don't know how to do it. And they, a challenge is that a lot of, there are a lot of small to medium sized obstacles to all this stuff that often people say, well, this is too hard, we're not gonna do it. Or the military doesn't really do it even though the civilians tell them to do it. So for instance, one way the United States used to recruit for its military before Trump is that you can make citizenship a path, um, sorry, service to the military pathway to citizenship. And so it's not an accident. There's a lot of Filipinos in San Diego. It's because, you know, the ships would dock in San Diego, San Diego, the U S Navy would say, Hey, you join the Navy. You will eventually become a citizen. In Canada, they say, we can't do that because it's hard to get security clearances for, for our foreigners. Uh, which also makes it hard then to get people in the military who are already permanent residents uh, because it's hard to get security clearances. And the thing is, somehow the American military was able to do that, and they have super secret stuff. So how do we do that? And I think one of the answers to that is that most, you know, privates and you know, junior level seamen and and new people who are, you know, whatever the lowest rank, I guess it's also private for the Air Force, they don't usually don't have access to stuff that's going to cause a major crisis if, if they, you know, turn out to be agents for the Chinese or for, right. for China or for Russia or whatever. It's a risk you got to take and you got to balance those risks and you can mitigate those risks, but it requires you to take an active decision. And, and one of the challenges that has faced a lot of government has been uh, a version of risk. Uh, and this is something that's risky, but it requires you to do the work and figure out ways around the risks. But you could do this. And then suddenly you increase your labor pool because it's not only the people who might want to come to Canada, but it's a bunch of people who have come to Canada who might want to do this, but can't because they're a security risk. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I mean, again, a lot of the problems we have, there's a lot of different reforms that we had. And all of them working together can make things much better. That would mean the force would be more diverse as well as having a larger recruiting pool. If you have a larger recruiting pool, then you can be more selective about the people who come in. So you get better people. You know, there was this awful story that came out of the United States this week where some judge was like, okay, you committed sexual assault. You, you can go to jail or go to the military. And everybody's like, no, this is exactly the people we don't want to come. And I don't think that that's really going to happen in that case. And it's certainly not what will happen in this case, but mm-hmm. it makes it much easier to get rid of people who are underperforming for whatever reason in the military. If you know that, they're not indispensable. And the problem is if you have a real recruiting crisis, everybody's seen as indispensable. So therefore you don't get rid of people who are marginal. So, you know, again, the spiral can go a positive spiral, a negative spiral. And right now we're in a negative spiral. Okay. Um, The other thing I just wanted to touch on when it comes to the capacity to aid is something you'd mentioned over Twitter uh, last week was around the experiences that happened in the long-term care homes and how that affected the soldiers who were sent in to, to take care of them. Yeah, um, there's two categories of harm that can happen from this. Um, there's post-traumatic stress dis- uh, syndrome that we're familiar with, and there's also a moral injury, which is different. And you have to talk to the people who are smart about these things to, to, to draw the differences, but they're different dynamics. 
But either way, being sent into places and seeing the abuse and neglect of, of, the, of the senior citizens of our country caused harm to the soldiers who were going there. They weren't expecting that. They were expecting you know, to feed people, maybe change a few you know, diapers and, and clean things out. But they weren't expecting to see abuse and neglect of a pretty wide scale. Mm-hmm. And so that was pretty disturbing to them. And, they, you know, it's not quite the same as being in combat uh, or near combat. But it's not quite the same as what their normal day job is. And so there, there have been discussions about how traumatic it was for some of these folks to see what they saw. And also they were seeing in the front lines of the, of the pandemics. They were also seeing lots of people dying from this disease. Yeah. Uh, we forget that originally, what, 70 or 80 percent of all the dead in Canada from COVID were senior citizens. Well, where, where were they dying? They were mostly dying in the elder care facilities where, you know, in, in the larger ones, which are in. Uh, mm-hmm. Quebec and Ontario. So they were they were at the front. They were in the front lines of this this war against this disease, and it was not you know it was, it was a pretty awful experience. So we can't just think that we can throw them into an emergency and think there are no consequences. You know, maybe if we throw them into a, a flood or a fire, yeah, some people might get burned or might you know might you know get some frostbite or whatever. But this is this is more people exposed to more harm than the usual emergency operation. I think. Yeah. And I think that's something that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, there are there are consequences for for um, relying on this capacity in this regard. Um, and anyway, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. It was a really interesting uh, conversation, and uh, we'll do this again. My pleasure, Dale. All right, cheers. And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith. That's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks, everyone.